Hi, everyone. Hi. I like this. This is kind of intimate, but you're all really distant. Sort of this weird, empty semicircle in front of the stage. This is the Line of Best Fit secret stage. Uh, I'm Jen Long. I host a podcast for the Line of Best Fit called Talk the Line. See what I did there? And uh, this is Alex Cameron and Roy. How are you doing, ladies and gentlemen? How's it going? Um, we're doing a Q&A, but you and I have had a previous conversation. We have. Yeah, we did, we did a podcast together all about your sexual history. That's right. It's fascinating. Was it? I, I thought so, yeah. Okay. Um, but we won't delve into your romantic, romantic history, your romantic ventures today. We're talking about your music. How are the stats on that podcast? How many? 10,000, something like that? Up? 12, 15? Wow. I don't know. Producer Paul does all the technical stuff. I just talk to people. That's pretty good. We met there as well. Yeah. Nice to see you. Good to see you, Paul. This is a QA. and a If anyone has a question, though, I think we should throw it open to the audience sure, at yeah. any point. So, you know, feel free to interject, start thinking, start dreaming up some questions, raise your hand, give us a shout. I realized after, after agreeing to do this, it was quite sort of uh, presumptuous of me to think that anyone would want to ask me a question. <laughs> I was what, kind of waiting for it. I was just expecting no one to be here. This is nice. Oh, I think it's nice to have a chat with you because when you play live, you assume mm. such a kind of character and there, there's so much um, confidence in your onstage persona. You're like a different person on the stage. And so I think it's quite interesting to talk to you about that and also just have a chat. Yeah, I, I think... Uh, I think... <clears throat> I like to think that it's just who I am when I'm on a stage, you know? Right. Because it's... It's not something that I uh, actively try and engage, you know, it's just more of, if when you're put in a position where you're in front of people and you have to perform, uh, you kind of, you got to switch something on inside you, you know. <laughs> but I like that everything gets wrapped up in like a narrative, every album, because, you know, a lot of the time when you, when an artist puts an album out, it's like, hi, I'm so-and-so, here's my brand new album. But with you, mm. you come up with all these storylines and characterizations, and mm. then you really bring that to life when you play. Yeah, I uh, I think we had a goal when we started that we weren't going to be uh, one of those bands that, that seem, was seemingly uh, apologetic to be on stage. Yeah. When, we, when we came up uh, playing shows in, in Sydney, I, uh, we saw that a lot in, in support bands and, and, in, and often in, in pubs and clubs. Just this really kind of, you know, sorry we're here, we're doing our show, you know, thanks for coming, maybe, you know. But uh, we decided to do something a little more uh, direct, a little more confident, I suppose. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, to assume that getting up dressed in the, you know, the clothes that you come come from working or whatever, to assume that just being you know being yourself on stage is going to be enough for anyone's a bit, bit of a wank, you know. Like <laughs> you put on a show, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and you two sort of come as a bit of a duo. Mm -hmm. Right. This is your business associate That's right. and saxophonist. That's right. Yep. How did you two meet? That was a long time ago. Uh, we were five or six, I guess, and I moved into the house two doors down. And uh, and uh, Alex's mother, Heather, a wonderful lady, a beautiful, beautiful soul. She saw me playing by myself and assumed that I was lonely. And made Alex come and come and hang out with me, but I wasn't lonely. I was I was just I just like to play by myself, you know. <laughs> I was I had tons of friends. This is school friends. We uh, and then later on we ended up going to school together as well. Yeah. Yeah, we went to high school together, and uh, it didn't really didn't really get along at first. And then uh, I guess we started hanging out, listening to music together. Once we were about sixteen, yeah, we just started playing in bands and. Getting work around Sydney and whatnot. Because you were in CK, who were a brilliant electronic Australian band around, what was it, the sort of mid-2000s? I guess we, we put, I put out the first record with CK in 2009. So, okay. yeah. yeah. What was that, eight years ago now? Yeah. There you go. There you go. And, Roy, what bands were you in? Um, I was, uh, me and Alex played in one band when we finished school. And then I was doing sort of my own thing for a little minute there. And then uh, this... Little project started up in what 2000, 2012, I guess. Yeah, we were. Uh, I was out of work, and so I and Roy got me a gig at a, a pizza restaurant, delivering pizzas and pounding dough and stuff. 
And then I had the demos. We used to listen to them in the pizza shop. Sounds delicious. Yeah, it, yeah. Well, it was very gluten full and I'm <laughs> exclusively gluten free. How much weight did you put on when you were working in a pizza shop? Because I would put on about three stone. Mostly the pizza. Pe- it wasn't a very good pizza shop. Most oh. of it was just, <laughs> I don't know, something happens to your physiology when you eat a pizza every single night. And I, th- I think you, d- you sort of evolve and it just passes right through you. It's like you ate nothing at all. <laughs> it was a really poorly run <laughs> restaurant <laughs> by these, these two brothers. And they were just so riddled with anxiety uh, about their business failing that they uh, could barely function as people. We, it, it was near, the, near a, a sporting ground. And, uh, and if we wanted to go home early, we could just say that we heard that everyone was really drunk at the football and they were going to be coming past soon because the game had just finished. Yeah. And they'd, cl- they'd hit their change to closed and shut down shop, turn the lights off. I would see that as a business opportunity. That was what we were saying, man. They were total cowards. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was unbearable. I saw. I once saw. Uh, his name was Chris. I once saw Chris uh, take the phone off the hook because there were too many orders coming in. Really? And that was it for me. <laughs> I feel like when I talk to you, I always have all these like really great narratives and stories about all these characters that you you've met along your your journey, and I like the way that you weave them into your album, into your songs. Mm. It feels like you kind of you kind of take inspiration from the characters that you've met. How much of that comes through in the new album, Forced Witness? Yeah, quite a lot. I think around the, around the same time that uh, that we were delivering pizza. So I would deliver pizza from Friday to Sunday, but then Monday to Friday I was working in a, a legal office. Okay, so that bit's actually, that oh, yeah. is actually true. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I worked at an office called the Ombudsman's Office in, in Sydney, which is, the, they call it the people's lawyer. I think uh, we have that here. If you ever get ripped off on your gas bill, mm, call the ombudsman. Yeah. So I worked in the like the police corruption division. So I was like assisting investigations into police corruption and stuff. So I was talking to victims of uh, or alleged victims and of um, of police corruption and and misconduct. So there's a lot of sad stories there. You know, there's a lot of stories that I mean, they're not directly on the record, but I was having to speak to these people on the phone. I was one big part of my job was editing down their their accusation, their complaint, uh, so that it was readable and admissible in court. And uh, yeah, I think that that sort of mentality and that that sense of like really specific personal tragedy is is definitely informed the way I write music and songs and about characters and stuff like that. You talk in your you've got an absolutely fabulous press release for this album, which isn't really about the usual like Alex Cameron was born in Sydney in whenever you know it's mm. like it's it's like written by you and a story and it feels like a like reading a kind of true crime detective the back of the novel kind of synopsis I really really enjoyed that oh I, mean, I hope so yeah I, I have fun writing that I always felt that with press uh it was really reckless of an of an artist to not uh be in control of what gets read about them mm. you know to hand off the bio for me just felt like really risky. Yeah, I've been in I've been in, in circumstances where there's a lot of stuff written about not a lot, but I've I've read stuff about myself written for like, for the purpose of promotion or publicity, and just thought, what? Nah. Now I'm in trouble because they just people seem journalists tend to regurgitate. Oh, we're we're really lazy. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say lazy. I just say leeches. Yeah, yeah. leeches. Yeah, Awful Thanks. people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it just, it's just something that for every opportunity we have to write something, uh, we'll take it just because I think we have a quiet confidence, you know, and that we, we probably know what to, how the best way to present it. You know. yeah, if, you read, if you're reading something about yourself that isn't true, it's like, why, why don't I just write this, you know? Like, yeah. why? I mean, who knows you better than you? That's right. <laughs> yeah. And who knows, you know, how how badly we need money yeah. and how badly we need success. But I liked in that press release that you said that you had a knack for kind of getting inside those stories and kind of bringing out the information and bringing out the truth. And is that sort of something that you actually do see in yourself or was that just an elaboration for, for the bio? Well, I did, I did wonder why they kept me on at that job because I don't have a degree. I don't know how I... I don't really... Outside of the fact that I think I'm just... I know how to present myself and happen to be a young white man, I can't understand why they would just hand me an opportunity mm. like that, you know. 
Um, I didn't have a degree. I just had some experience working in, in offices. And I got this, this job that my friends who had law degrees would have really liked to have had, you know. Yeah. Uh, and they they kept asking me to stay on, but I had a I started really having a bad uh, emotional moment there in 2014. Uh, I started to capitulate. Uh, Roy can vouch for that. Yeah, you went in the best shape. Yeah, mentally, I guess. And uh, and so I had to leave the job. I was I said to the the um, deputy ombudsman, I said I gotta get out of here because <clears throat> I'm freaking out. You know, I, I can't I can barely sit down. Weirdest thing happened. My my the head of my area, my division was like, I said to him, I said, I think there's something wrong with my heart. It keeps beating out of time, you know. And he said, oh, I get that all the time. It's just the stress of the job. And I was like, oh man. I can't, he's been doing it for like 30 years. I was like, I can't do it, man. I'm freaking out. I'm, I got to get out of here. So I took a I took a break, and which turned into an extended break, which turned into never going back. Um. But I think the way that those stories that they're really, you have like, I was taught when I worked at the, in that office, you have like a, a, a level of um, tolerance, you have a threshold for empathy as a person. There's only so much human tragedy you can take on board before you have to silence it or numb yourself to it. Um, and, and I felt that at the end of that tether uh, or towards the edge of that threshold um, is a really awful, uh, seemingly permanent anxiety, you know. So I, I had to take a step away from it, it did, and that and that, get that that threshold does inform the writing on the on the record a lot. Well, maybe it was it some somewhat cathartic to then I guess go home and put these things onto paper and turn them into songs. I don't know. I've I've perhaps it's hard. I don't really have like a, an enlightened <laughs> sense about me. <laughs> I'm still as oblivious as ever, you know. How were you? So you were working weekends in the pizza place. Weekdays for the ombudsman, yeah. But then you were writing songs together in the evening, or do you write solo? I was writing at home on a on a little keyboard. Yeah, I had a little my my ex girlfriend who I lived with, who was my girlfriend at the time, who we spoke about very well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know her well. I know a lot about her. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> she had this. This uh, is the podcast. It's very revealing. She wanted, she wanted to learn the piano, so she got this pia this electric piano in, and I ended up playing on that. Yeah. You looked like you were going to say something. Oh no! I was just—I was going to say about the two jobs. Yeah. Sydney's the kind of place where most, where if you're a young person, you got two jobs. It costs, Why is that? It's ruinously expensive to live yeah. there. And especially yeah. rent, right? Yeah, the rent side, the, and buy a coffee or whatever's costly. Like Sydney, we always complain about flats and houses in London, but Sydney's worse, right? Australia's. Sydney's unlivable for a, if you're trying to make a living. Like oh, you, you know, you don't have a disposable income if you're if you're living off your wage, you know. That's not the kind of town where you can make a lot of money. And are you mostly over here now? Or are you in the States? Or is it Berlin last time I spoke to you? We live out of, we live out of our suitcases. Yeah. It's the dream. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when, when, you know, when you're doing it, the dream is to have a, have a place that you've rented, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I'd love to be able to afford rent. I think we're getting there. 2018, um, we reckon we're going to... 2018, you're going to get that flat. Yeah, we're going to rent something. End should of 2018. I, should I throw it open? Does anyone have a burning question for Alex Cameron? No. No one. Oh, we got oh one. there we go. Hi. Hello, sir. Uh, first of all, um, you know, welcome to Britain as an Australian. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm going to reiterate that for the benefit of the recording. What is your plan for using your voice to make this world a better place? Yeah, that's that's a kind of a, a paralyzing thought for me because at the back of my mind when I'm writing, it's always there. You know, it's always that concern's always there. How am I? What am I contributing? And what's the what's the vision for me as an artist? It's also a voice that I I try and silence a lot because I don't think I ever want to be the kind of person that is. 100% uh, conscious of the work that I'm making and, and its and its impact, but I was always aware of this record that I just wrote, Forced to Witness. The lyrics on it were always going to be about. Uh, I had this vision of this man, like an ex Navy guy, and he had like white, long white hair, and I had him had him pegged as being a um, 
Ad Impact as being a uh, like a naval uh, psychiatrist who was, whose job was to prescribe um, medication to to people, uh, I guess, uh, sailors with um, post-traumatic stress disorder or something like that. And then I, I kind of gave him this, this conservative view as a person so that... Uh, I could under, I tried to understand what his view, what his views would be of, of the current the way the world is you know uh, with with the idea of progress and how that would be confronting to him as someone who would who has come from a previous generation as the world changes he would have problems with it changing around him because he would feel less and less in control of things um, his sex life included you know and and then I decided to throw in there this element that maybe he would fall in love with with a refugee and maybe it was his job to stop refugees coming to Australia, you know? So he, he was kind of conflicted there. And I thought, well, maybe there's something to do with, maybe if these these people, especially politicians in Australia who are just completely, I mean, really, it's there's nothing more despicable than a, than a politician that would make policy out of a, out of a human's position, you know, and, and, and try and position themselves as a politician around that as opposed to just helping people. So I think in, in writing about characters that have a, uh, a kind of a deplorable or, or I guess morally bankrupt uh, view of the way the world operates, uh, I was hoping that I could sort of dismantle them over time. If, even if I have characters that are, that are bigots or bullies or, um, or you know, void of, uh, void of a kind of backbone that, that is, is, has a view of progress, um, I think if, that if I can explore them and dismantle them, then people should be able to uh, people should be able to extrapolate what they need to get out of the story morally. You know, that's kind of what I was hoping in the back of my mind I would be able to do. I hope that makes sense. Oh, oh, I, mean, I hope so. It'll be number two hundred fifty-seven. <laughs> Do you think it's an artist's responsibility to speak out against things? Because I think we've seen this week with uh, Taylor Swift making her return, a lot of think pieces around how she hasn't been outspoken against, say, maybe President Trump in the States, where a lot of artists stood up and put their hand up and said, we're voting for Hillary last mm -hmm. year. So she's been getting a lot of stick for that. Do you think it's an artist's responsibility to kind of take on that role once you have a platform? Uh, I think that um, I, th I felt while I was making the record, and I continue to feel this way, that uh, it would be much more offensive for, for me to not include my views on the record. I think, I think I'm more offended by music that doesn't have a message than I am by an artist tweeting something. You know, I think that I, I, I would hope that my work speaks in a, in a way that uh, represents who I am as a person and what I stand for, you know, which is ultimately progress and acceptance. Got a little bit of a dodgy connection. Is this what? Yeah, here we go. Uh, yeah, but I, I do, um, I do think so. Once it's hard for an artist, I think at our level to really, to really um, project through our like connection with the fans or, or our small audience, really uh, what our views are. But I think over time, yeah, I would. My aim would be to be more vocal. If I, the more, if we ever gain a, a level of influence that, that. Uh, requires, you know, um, I suppose, for us to speak out, and absolutely, I'd be all for it. Yeah, I mean, we we use things like Facebook, and uh, we write long pieces on Facebook that people can read. Roy, Roy, what you, you wrote one the other day? Yeah, I wrote about uh, the Charlottesville uh, thing in America. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you can make yourself known. I mean, if you don't, if you earnestly don't have an opinion, then fine. If you've got a dumb opinion, then. Maybe keep your mouth shut, but you know, if you think you got the right idea and you got the platform, then sure. I don't know if it's a responsibility or not, but there's, uh, you know, it'd be pretty pretty vacant to not address something like that if it's on your mind. Agreed. Does anyone else have a question for Alex or Roy? Well, let's talk about your sex. You're, you haven't played yet, have you? You're playing this evening. We're playing this evening and we're playing tomorrow as well, I think. Oh, okay. Where are you playing this evening? Two for the price of one. Oh, we're not playing this evening. Oh, we are playing this evening. That's, that's Clemence, our, our agent. We are playing this evening at the Secret Ten or something. What is it? The Tent of Secrets? 
Sounds like something. Is your main show tomorrow, though? Our main set's tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. So you're here to see some What's music tonight? We're here to hang out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, I think we're going to... We, we're staying in a teepee. You know? Ooh, fancy. It is fancy. Yeah. I was expecting something more fancy. <laughs> and then someone set my expectations lower and said it's going to be awful. And then we got there and it was pretty fancy. So it's like perfect. Was that? Did you know that it was going to be fancy, Clemence? And you want? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's better. It, Clemence is uh, legendary for her expectation management. <laughs> Where are you playing tomorrow? Is it one of the biggest, the big top maybe? I can't remember. It's the big top. It is the big top, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's quite a big stage. What do you have planned? Or is it is it a sort of surprise, a secret? Um... No, we're, we're sort of like, we used to be a two-piece. We used to play uh, just with like uh, an iPad as a backing track and Roy plays saxophone and I would sing. Uh, and we've since brought on some uh, some friends of ours to play with us. So it's starting to really cook, you know, it's starting yeah. to feel really good on stage and uh, the action's feeling like hotter and hotter. Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. I hope everyone feels like coming to watch a rock show. <laughs> we got uh, we got Mr. Justin Nyson on guitar. He's, uh, he's back there, I can see him. There he is. There he is. Yeah. Where, where, who else we got? Is it Henry? Hen of course, Henry's not here. He's on. Henry's gone for a jog, because uh, he's he's emotionally troubled. <laughs> and uh, we've got we got Boris, our tour manager over there. He's a good guy. And Mr. We got Jack Ladder here with us, who's a songwriter from Australia. He's playing guitar with us, and he's on tour with us at the moment. So we're all gonna hang out and and put on a show. I think we got about 50 minutes or something. So that's a long time. Yeah. Did you say it's a long time? Long time, yeah. The one I, I one time, I one time someone said about one of our sets, like, yeah, it was, uh, it was long. <laughs> it's like what? That's all you took away from it? The length of it? People have a way of uh, when you when you come off stage to have a way of uh, saying really general statements that don't side on a, an opinion. Like, yeah, that was a that was a music show, man. You guys definitely were up there as a band playing your instruments individually, and it made music. I guess I've only ever seen you play in a, in a small kind of intimate setting oh. and you it feels like you play off the audience quite a lot so I was just wondering like how you were going to take that to a bigger stage perhaps yeah. one where you're blinded by the lights and you can't see the front row yeah festivals uh, it's a good thing that I, I think we've got pretty decent songs because we can just play them <laughs> <laughs> don't have to do so much talking I get we, we get bad reviews about how much talking we do we play in France and stuff, and uh, people get up us about it, you know? Play another song, that yeah. sort of thing. So they don't like the banter in France? Uh, it's 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 half-half. The, the crowd will get in an argument with each other, and we just have to leave them to their own devices. I kind of feel like you do have... I don't know if you... Maybe you, you say it's like a Vegemite thing, but we would say it's like a Marmite thing, where people like either love it or hate it. Because oh, you, okay. you are quite a strong character, and especially when you play live. I think it's it's easy for... For uh, it's easy for men to get in the comment section. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I sometimes feel like uh, when they when a, when a man starts, it's never it's never women. It's always a man, and he's always yelling out like "you suck" or like "shut up and play another song." You know, and I'm always like, "Well, what do you know? Another guy has an opinion, and he feels comfortable yelling <laughs> it out in public." <laughs> do you read? Do you do you read your own sort of press album reviews? Live reviews. Ruthlessly, yes. Yeah. Every single We've got piece a folder, a dossier, <laughs> comments, the whole thing. Do you have a shit list? I got an enemies list, yeah. for sure. Uh, you got actual <laughs> list of journalists who've done you wrong? Yeah. <laughs> What's the grand plan, Roy? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that, you know. That's, <laughs> that's going to be a surprise for them, you know. Yeah. I bet it'd be nice to you. Um, I would really <laughs> like to be dismantled by a really well written review. I would love that. No one could give me a worse review than I've already given myself in my head. I'm telling you. I always find like the, the bad reviews that I read are never particularly well written. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the thing that irks me more. Yeah. When I read a, a negative review of an artist's work that hasn't been written particularly well, and yeah. you just think, you only listened to that album once. You've not even got correct punctuation in here. Yeah, it's awful to get a, it's awful to get a bad review written by someone who's a bad writer. <laughs> I don't know who, who's reading music reviews. Does anyone like I read them because they're about our band, but I usually just I haven't look at ever the score. read another person's music review. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just look at the number. Look at the number of stars. Has anyone here read a music review in the last fortnight? 
You have? Well, oh, well. I think this is for a... a Are you really bored? What's going on? <laughs> Waiting this for is, a bus or something? This is a, this is a Q&A for a magazine that does music reviews. Right. It's all right. It's a website. It's fine. We do other stuff too. <laughs> well, I mean, the podcast seems to be going well, so there podcast you go. podcast's been pretty yeah. good, yeah. Did I you guys review our new record? I have no idea. Probably. Where's Paul? Oh, he's gone. The editor's not here. He's left. Okay. But he's got bored and left. Any other questions from the crowd? Oh, here, is he back here? Anything no, less than no. an 8 out of 10 is a... Yeah, you got an enemy for what life. What was the score, oh, Paul? Come here, Paul. Say it to our face. What was the score for Alex's uh, album on the line of best fit? Yeah, Nine. right. Yes. <laughs> I don't trust that face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I like this. I think every journalist should have to say the score to, to our face. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like reviews would be nicer if you had to deliver them in person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now we're talking. They'd be more thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that, that was an album. Yeah, that <laughs> album goes for 40 minutes. <laughs> Anyone else got a final question for Alex before we wrap up this Q&A and let him get off to his partying secret set secret shenanigans? Party set. It's your last chance, guys. No pressure. No pressure. Was we, could that do a classic, we could do a classic question, couldn't we? Oh. Oh, what time is your secret set? Do you know what? I think it's around 12.15 or something. Secret. 10 part... 12.15. We're playing tonight at 12.15 somewhere. Here we go, you got a question. How are you doing there? You're going to have to project. What do we think of England? Um, we, have, we have pretty harsh things to say about England. Uh, we talk a lot about it in the van, you know. It, we have an interesting thing because we, um, we come from Australia and, and we're a result of uh, British sort of colonialization, you know. And so we have to there's a lot of there's a lot of work to be done in Australia to overcome or to, you know, solve the problems that were that are created by what happens when a a race goes around the world, you know. It's it's a it's a white person thing. We have to find a way to properly address what we've done, you know. You got a, you got something to say, Roy? About England? Uh yeah, the, the uh, you know, people are really nice, but uh you know, same as ever, you've got to give even footing to the good and bad, haven't you? And uh, yeah, I, no, I like England. I'm not going to talk a bunch of shit to English people. Oh, man. A bunch of nonsense to English people who come on stage and tear us limb from limb. You know? Yeah, we've got to be careful. If you found Roy's laptop and read the fold that says on the English, it'd be, you'd be shocked at how awful. But in public, you know, we have to be presentable. Keeping in mind that you could, we are, I mean, we're, we're outnumbered right now. And you could come on stage and and, and kill us, because <laughs> you guys are, are violent. <laughs> you have a violent history, going around the world killing people, and we're a part of that. But Marks and Spencer sandwiches, though, right? Ooh. I have. A, I get the. I get the rice and chicken uh, salad, and it's delicious. I've eaten. I eat. I eat one every day. It's gluten free. Marks and Spencer is definitely one of my favorite things about England. It's a wonderful, wonderful chain. Roy, um, I don't think you've paid for anything from Marks and Spencer's this whole week. I always see Roy just walk out, and he gives this like side eye to the, to the security guard. Like, I dare to ask me for my receipt. And the guy's just like, okay. That's what you get for doing the automatic checkout thing. If you see one of those automatic checkout things, you've got to steal what it is you're buying. Because, you know, they're, they're firing young people so they can replace them with the machines, and I didn't feel, I didn't feel my quinoa salad get any cheaper due to that, so... <laughs> So I'm not paying for it. <laughs> You're an activist, really. Thank you, yeah. yeah. Roy lost his job to robots. Yeah, I was made redundant right before we, uh, we embarked on this little journey. What uh, was your job? I was a, a tram conductor. They, uh, back in Sydney, we were still on the conductor system. You know, you go up and down and sell the tickets. And then they, uh, they, they got rid of the, t like the, the, the cash tickets and made it some sort of contactless card. So we were going down checking them. And then I think someone... Uh, realized that they could save money and and fire us. Um, at you know at a at a huge cost to customer service and whatever. Roy's an award-winning tram conductor. 
He's, no way. Yeah, he's the best con- best tram conductor 2014 in Australasia. A round of applause yeah. for Roy. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. That was a that was one of my um, that's one of my proudest achievements. So thank you very much. I feel like we've learned a lot about you guys. Thank Every you so much. It's nice hanging out. And we'll see you at the uh, disco ship later, yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And tomorrow. I never know if anyone's going to come watch our show, so I'm not afraid to ask you guys to come watch our show. Go and watch his show and give him a round of applause. Thank you very much, Roy and Alex. Thanks. Thanks.